宾，呃，欢迎来到清华，欢迎参加清华博班的这个活动。今天晚上大家都很激动，是吧？我也不废话了。今天是六年之后，两位老师的又一次巅峰对话，能碰撞出来什么，我们不知道。我们充满了期待。而且今年跟六年之前有点不一样的地方是，我们邀请了一位重量级的主持人，就是我的前辈，我的同事。清华大学国际关系学系的教授，也是清华大学中美关系研究中心的中心的主任陈奇老师。下面欢迎陈奇老师主持分享活动。谢谢谢谢谢谢。呃，刚刚大家 be happy to moderate this very important uh the uh, debate between America's Yan Xuetong and China's Yan Shaiman. <laughs> uh, since yeah, since the first debate in uh ninety. Thirteen. So a lot of things has changed, and especially the tensions between China and U.S. escalated since 1918. So I would think. So all of us looking forward to to hear. So these two important theories, uh, realist theories, uh, explanation of this. Tension to China, uh, this aspiration takes to China and U.S. So I would uh, very happy to invite both of them come to one. So actually, I would not need to introduce these three to uh, professors. So uh, a lot of audience outside they can they they, they cannot enter this. This uh, classroom, or this classroom. So uh, the, today, today is this debate or dialogue. So we will have two rounds. So the first rounds will forty minutes. So every uh, so two, both of you have twenty minutes for presentations. Okay. So uh, firstly, I would be very yeah, honored to uh, invite Professor John Mishamer to present. Let's welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much to Professor Yan for inviting me. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk for 20 minutes about my new book. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what I tried to do in the book was I tried to discuss American foreign policy during the unipolar moment. I try to talk about a policy which is commonly called liberal hegemony. This is the policy that the United States, foreign policy that the United States pursued from roughly 1990 until January 2017, when President Trump moved into the White House. And this was, and it's very important to understand this, highly ideological foreign policy. Now, I believe that when a country like the United States lives in either a bipolar world or a multipolar world, it has no choice but to act according to the dictates of realism, of realpolitik. Thus, I believe that during the Cold War, when the United States was confronted with the Soviet Union, it behaved according to balance of power politics. I believe that in the world that we now live in, which is multipolar, the United States has no choice but to behave in a real policy fashion. But during the unipolar moment, from roughly 1990 to 2017, during those years, the United States was free to pursue an ideological foreign policy because it had no rival great power. See, if you're in a bipolar world or a multipolar world, you have to behave according to realpolitik because there are other great powers in the system. Well, there are no other great powers, by definition, in unipolarity. And therefore, you don't have to worry about the balance of power. You are Godzilla. This is the United States during the post-Cold War period. 
during the unipolar moment. So it was free to pursue an ideological foreign policy. And of course, the United States is a liberal democracy. And not surprisingly, the United States pursued liberal hegemony, which is a highly ideological foreign policy. Now you're saying to yourself, what exactly is liberal hegemony? What exactly was the United States doing during the Europolar moment? What we were doing was trying to remake the world in America's image. And there were three dimensions to our strategy. First, we were trying to make every country on the planet a liberal democracy. Another way of saying that is we were trying to make every country on the planet look like us. We wanted to make China a liberal democracy. We wanted to make Russia a liberal democracy. And the Bush Doctrine, the famous Bush Doctrine, was designed to make all the countries in the greater Middle East into liberal democracy. That's the first goal. The second goal is to get every country on the planet integrated into the open international economy that the United States had played the principal role in creating. In other words, you want to get everybody hooked on capitalism. You want to get China and Russia both deeply embedded in that international economy, that open international economy. Remember the efforts that we went to to get China into the World Trade Organization, to get China deeply hooked on capitalism. And then third, what you want to do is you want to get all the countries in the world deeply embedded in international institutions. Again, get China into the WTO, get the Russians into the IMF, get the Russians uh, into the World Trade Organization, and so forth and so on. These are all very important things to do. And this is all part and parcel of making countries look like the United States. So this is the basic goal of liberal hegemony. And it is, again, just to repeat myself, not driven by balance of power considerations. Because the United States does not have to worry about the balance of power because it's the unipolar. Now the question is, what are the benefits of doing this? Why is the United States doing this? Basically for two main reasons. The first reason is the United States, as a liberal democracy, cares greatly about human rights. As you know, any time the United States thinks that human rights are being violated anywhere in the world, it gets involved. You can see this with regard to Hong Kong today. The United States Congress is beginning to move so that the United States will intervene in the politics of Hong Kong because some people believe that human rights violations are taking place. So the Americans care greatly about human rights. And the belief is that if you can turn every country on the planet into a liberal democracy, there will be no more massive violations of human rights. You take the human rights problem off the table. That's one of the great benefits. The other great benefit is that liberals believe that liberal democracies never fight each other. This is called democratic peace theory. And many of you students in the audience surely have heard of democratic peace theory. Well, if you can make every country on the planet into a liberal democracy, you get what I like to call peace, love, and dope. <laughs> right? Because liberal democracies don't fight each other. And furthermore, if you have a problem with terrorism, you have a problem with nuclear proliferation, if you create a peaceful world, those problems largely disappear. This is what we thought would happen. And it didn't work out very well. It didn't work out very well. Uh, the Unipol, the Unipol thought that it had the wind in its back. Many of you remember the famous Frank Fukuyama article, The End of History. That was an article that was written in 1989. It basically said the United States had won against fascism 
in the first half of the 20th century, one against communism in the second half of the 20th century. And now there was only one possible political alternative for every country on the planet. And that was liberal democracy. It was liberal democracy. So eventually, every country, China included, Russia, was going to turn into a liberal democracy. So here you have this superpower. The United States, this tremendous military <laughs> capability, and it believes it has its wind, it has the wind in its back, that it's going to be easy to spread liberal democracy. Do you have any doubts about this? Go back and read the Frank Fukuyama piece from 1989. You can just, the optimism just oozes off the page. We thought it was going to be easy to do this, right? And. Uh, we, therefore, basically set off on a crusade. The United States became a crusader state early in the post-Cold War period. And our basic aim, again, was to remake the world in America's image. What happened? It was a colossal failure. Let me just give you three examples. One is the Bush Doctrine. The Bush Doctrine, as I said to you, was designed to turn the Middle East into a sea of democracy. We thought in 2001, after we invaded Afghanistan, knocked off the Taliban, and put Karzai in power, that we had basically created the foundation for liberal democracy in Afghanistan. Then we decided in 2002, 2003, that we were going to invade Iraq. We went into Iraq thinking we were going to turn it into a liberal democracy. And then eventually we would go to Syria, go to Iran. And then you'd have a whole sea of liberal democracies in the Middle East. How well did that work out? It was a colossal disaster. The amount of murder and mayhem that the United States has created in the greater Middle East is hard to believe. Really hard to believe. Total failure. Just think about it. Afghanistan, longest war in American history. It's only a matter of time before we lose. Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, not a single success in many disasters. Next case I'd like to talk about is NATO expansion. NATO expansion coupled with European Union or EU expansion, coupled with the color revolutions. Remember the color revolutions designed to spread democracy into places like Ukraine, that's the Orange Revolution, into Georgia, that's the Rose Revolution. The idea was we were going to move these alliances eastward. The EU, NATO, could promote democracy in Ukraine, promote democracy in Georgia, consolidate democracy in Hungary, consolidate democracy in Poland. We're remaking the world in America's image, creating liberal democracies, spreading institutions, the EU and NATO eastward. Getting countries hooked on capitalism. What do you think spreading the EU eastward is all about? How well did that work out? We ended up with a war in Georgia in August 2008. The Russians were not going to tolerate any more NATO expansion or EU expansion or color revolution. And then in February 2014, the Ukraine crisis came poisoned the relations between Russia and the West. Failure. Third example is engagement with China. What were we doing with China? The idea was that we got China hooked on capitalism, integrated them into the open international economy, got them integrated in insti into institutions like the World Trade Organization. The end result would be that China would become a responsible stakeholder, a responsible stakeholder. And then China would become a democracy. And of course, once China's a democracy and America's a democracy, we're guaranteed to live happily ever after, because democracies never fight against each other. There'll never be any human rights violations in China, and so forth and so on. How well has that one worked out? You've noticed that engagement has gone down the toilet bowl, and we're now involved with containing. The United States is now containing China. In fact, we're going beyond containment, in my opinion, 
and we're now engaged in rollback. The United States is now playing rough. And has China become a democracy? Does China look like the United States? You all know the answer to that is no. So that's another failure. The Bush Doctrine, US policy, or Western policy in Eastern Europe, failure. Engagement with China, failure. Why don't we fail? Failed for two reasons, two main reasons. One, nationalism, and two, realism. With regard to nationalism, the fact of the matter is nationalism is the most powerful political ideology on the planet. And nationalism is all about sovereignty and self-determination. And countries like China and countries like Russia do not like countries like the United States sticking their nose in their politics. The Americans, by the way, don't like it either. Most of you know that the Americans are still very angry about the Russians interfering in the 2016 presidential election. What was going on there? They were violating our sovereignty. Well, my mother taught me when I was a little boy, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And if we don't like the Russians interfering in our elections, you can rest assured the Russians are not going to like us interfering in their elections. Any more than the Chinese are going to like us interfering in their politics, interfering in what's happening in Hong Kong. So once you have an ambitious foreign policy of liberal agenda, once you're a crusader state and you're running around the world sticking your nose in the politics of other countries, there's going to be pushback. And there's going to be pushback because nationalism is a powerful force. And that's just China and Russia. What happens when you invade countries like Afghanistan, invade countries like Iraq? They don't like you being in their country and running their politics either. Remember what happened to the Soviets when they went into Afghanistan in 1979? That one did not happen end happily. When I was young, we went into Vietnam. That one did not end happily. Has our experience in Afghanistan or Iraq gone very well? No, they haven't. The policy failures because of nationalism. And nationalism again is all about self-determination. The second reason it failed is this good old question of realpolitik. And what happens here is when the United States moves NATO up to Russia's borders, Russia sees a military alliance that was a mortal fall of the Soviet Union during the Cold War, now coming up to the border, the very border of Russia. They say this is just unacceptable. The idea that Ukraine, the idea that Georgia are going to be turned into Western bulwarks right on the Russians' border, not going to happen. That's what Vladimir Putin said. The United States may be pursuing liberal hegemony. The United States may not be concerned with realism. But the Russians are. The Chinese are. And the Russians are not having any more of NATO expansion. The end result is the Ukraine crisis. I can point to all sorts of other examples. The point is, these policies failed because liberalism was trumped by nationalism and by realism, and especially by nationalism. Very hard to be a crusader state in the age of nationalism. So the policy failed. The question is, where are we today? Liberal hegemony is finished. And it's finished for two reasons. The first reason is Donald Trump. <laughs> understand that Donald Trump ran against liberal hegemony. Just think about the three strands of liberal hegemony, spreading democracy, an open international economy, and international institutions. Trump ran on the platform, we're getting out of the business of spreading democracy around the world. With regard to an open international economy, you all noticed Trump loves tariffs. He's slapping tariffs on everybody, left and right, allies, adversaries, you name it. He does not believe in an open international economy the way the liberal hegemonists did it. With regard to institutions, the guy's never seen an institution he didn't hate. He hates the WTO, he hates NATO, he hated NAFTA. 
He hates the IMF, he hates the World Bank, he pulled out of the TPP shortly after becoming president. He ran against the liberal hegemony that his predecessors had pursued. And you know what? He won. He's in the White House. Because enough Americans agreed with him to help get him elected. So because of the coming of Trump, which is inextricably linked with the failure of liberal hegemony, Trump is in the White House, and that's good evidence that liberal hegemony is dead. But there's a more important reason, my second reason, why liberal hegemony is dead. And that is, we are no longer in a unipolar world. Because of the rise of China, and because of the resurrection of Russian power, we now live in a multipolar world. And remember what I told you at the very beginning. When you're in a multipolar world, all of the great powers, including the United States, have to operate according to the dictates of realism. They cannot operate according to ideological considerations. You can only do that in unipolarity. This, of course, just to turn to China for a second, is why we have moved from engagement, which was a liberal policy, to containment and even rollback. That is because we are no longer in the unipolar moment. We are in multipolarity. And the United States is in the business of competing with China and competing with Russia, which is exactly what you would expect. That my friends, is the end of the story. Thank you. Ten minutes. Okay, professor, thank you, Professor uh, Xiaomi Shenmue. So, so after your presentations, I, I, I'm sure and more and more our PhD students will list your new book as the required readings. <laughs> so next, well, Professor Yen, please. Thank you, Professor Chen. And just now, and uh, Professor Mir Schemer gave you a very clear and a brief introduction about his book. Here we have two books here. <laughs> Actually, these two books are really the books. And uh, so some people said that today the dialogue between me and Mir Schemer is the second civil war between the civil uh, uh, realists. Well, actually, just now, I, I first I will start it from the common ideas we share for these two books. And first, because we are realist, we, have, we believe the international configuration and plays a very strong impact on major powers of behavior. That means that if in the unipolar world, and the US enjoys the, uh, a solo superpower position, and no one can compose any challenge to the US. So, like the Mr. Hammer argued that the liberalist idea can be put into their foreign policy and possibly make some achievements. But when they move into the bipolar system or the multipolar system, and that kind of a strategy driven by the liberalism will not work. And actually, in this, in this point, I would agree with the Professor Mr. Hammer that the international configuration does have impact on the major powers of the day. But meanwhile, there's some difference. I will talk about that. And uh, even in the same uh, uh, international configuration, a different leadership will adopt a different strategy to carry out, uh, uh, to, to purchase their national interests. And the second common idea of shared between us is that it's uh, about the, uh, uh, the, the approach to doing the uh, a creating theory. You found that just now, Professor Mir Schemer lists all of the facts and the events to support his argument. This really is the approach to doing the theory. And unlike the other schools, they may base on concept to concept, ideas by ideas. They never apply their ideas or arguments to the reality. But for realism, and we always try to limit our arguments to the facts and the historical facts and the current facts. So in these two books, you will find that there's a lot of facts. And the one thing I want to, not in my book, I want to suggest, uh, 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 suggest from the 
facts uh, listed by uh, Professor Nish Hammer that the liberalist, the you all know this, uh, uh, lib, uh, the liberal, the piece of the liberalism. They said the democratic dem dem democracy piece. That means the democratic countries never fight against each other. But actually, in uh, uh, pro Professor's book, that he lists the four cases: the war between the U.S. and the Spain, the war between the U.K. and the Boer in the South Africa, the uh, the war between the uh, who else? And uh, World, World, oh, the, uh, World War One. The, yeah, the, between the Germany and the uh, U, uh, U.K. and uh, in the World War One, and also we have the war between the uh, Pakistan and the uh, India. They are all democratic system. So the democratic system doesn't work. So in this way, and uh, uh, this is also my argument, and it's a, a kind of an anti-system determinism. I think the leadership is a fundamental uh, uh, independent variable inside of the uh, political system. And the third thing that we share with each other is that, that any foreign policy and uh, against the law of international powers, it will be punished by, uh, by the system. That means that if you adopt a policy inconsistent with the nature against the anarchy of the international system, and then the policy will work effectively. If you adopt policy against the, uh, uh, the nature of the anarchy international system, and then the policy cannot uh, achieve the goal. So that's what we share with each other. But uh, we, have the, we have the dialogue today. It's not trying to talk about what we share with each other. We want to, I want to tell you what the difference between us. And the first is difference that, and uh, uh, Professor Mish Hammer concerned the system, the international system, especially the, uh, uh, no, uh, the, the anarchical character of the international system, will free drive the powers, the nation states behave in the same way. Actually, from my understanding, it's not, not exactly. And uh, in terms of principle, in the anarchical society, all of the nations rely on their their, their own help. Their, their security rely on their own help. No one help them. So that's why and uh, the weak countries, they're looking for the superpowers, the military powers for protection. Because they cannot save themselves, their own security, though they're looking for others' help. But it doesn't mean all of the weak states are looking for strong powers uh, for help. For instance, North Korea is not looking for anyone's help. Right? He purely rely on themselves. So now in the you cannot believe that in the same system, all of the actors will behave exactly the same. And uh, this is uh, because the different uh, leaders, I mean the national leaders, will adopt a different strategy to deal with this. Like a Professor Mish Kamer argued that this liberalist policy actually mainly decided, adopted by the liberal leaders before Trump. But from Trump, labor foreign policy no longer uh, 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 popular. And at least the Trump administration do not like that. Trump administration has no interest to advance democracy all over the world. And so it just now, prof, uh, Professor, attribute uh, this change to what? To the change of international configuration from the uh, a unipolar system to the uh, multipolar system, I would say the bipolar system. Actually, this change not just started from the trend. And actually this trend, if we use the GDP as an indicator to measure the change of international configuration, it started from when? It started from the 2010. And from 2010, China became the second largest economy. And also, the share of China's uh, uh, GDP, and the, China, the, the China's GDP already account for and the 60% of the U.S. by 2012. Trump came to power by what? Nine, uh, 2017. Five years later than that. So when Trump came to power, America's foreign policy changed very suddenly. And then you find that Trump is a president who do not like war. And before him, all of the American presidents from the 
the, 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 the 1990s to uh, before Trump, they all initiated a war in their uh, uh, presidency. Trump is the only president didn't initiate any war. He only shot uh, 56 missiles at uh, Syria. That's the only thing he did. And he didn't initiate any war. He tried to get us out, out of the war. And someone he liked trade war. Trade war is much better than real war. <laughs> Right? So you see, his preference is the trade war, is the economic approach or strategy against China, is that the military approach or political approach. So I want, what I want to say is that now, even within the same international configuration, and the leading power may adopt a different, very different strategy to dealing with the, the rivalries to protect their national security, like that. So this is a what uh, uh, I argued in my book and why Trump is so different from the uh, previous uh, American president. And the second difference is, is that America <coughs> cannot maintain its uh, 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 labor uh, hegemony. It's not because of the chain of the international configuration only. We have to deepen the question, who shaped the international configuration? The international configuration changed by China's rise. That means that China changed the configuration by what? By making itself stronger and stronger. So that this is beyond American's capability. It's beyond American capability to contain China, to, make, to slow China's uh, rise. So in that way, we find that, hey, wait a minute. Why China cannot, China rise uh, 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 in the 21st century, but not in the 20th century? We have the same system. America have the same system, political system. If that's a capitalist system, there's a socialist system. And then in our experience of that, before 1978, our government didn't reform this country in positive direction as much as we did after 1978. And because of this political reform, and because of the strategy of opening up, and then will make China become stronger and stronger. That means the capability of the leadership especially the capability of reform decided and whether a country becomes stronger or, or weaker. So if you look at the American history after the Cold War, you find that, and that's my view, Clinton did more reform than the, all of the other presidents. The other president didn't change very much and the, like uh, Clinton did during uh, his, in his presidency. And uh, actually, the Trump is a, a really debate, a debatable. And someone argued that Trump changed this country. And I think everyone agree with the change, but then people will argue, this is a reform or is it retrogress? That's different. You change the country in positive direction or negative direction. That's a different thing. And so from my understanding at this moment, and uh, Trump at least, and uh, make uh, Americans' leadership decline faster than the previous uh, presidents after the Cold War. So maybe someone argue that, and the Trump makes the Americans' economy uh, growing faster than Bush period than, uh, than the, the, uh, Obama. That's true, but not as fast as uh, what Clinton did to the United States. During Clinton's period, America's economy grew even faster than now. So here you find that no matter you examine Americans' leaderships or Chinese leaderships, you find that different, different, uh, different leaderships will bring out different rate of the growth. So this kind of reform, my understanding, the reform capability of a leadership will decide it. a country grow in stronger, quickly, slowly, or stagnant or undermined. So 
in this case, you find that this is a, 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 the, another difference between uh, me and uh, Mitch Kevin. The, the, uh, the last difference is, I want to say, is about the, the role of the ideology. I cannot agree with the uh, Professor Mitch Kemmer more about this argument that <coughs> the liberalism cannot make the world safe. The liberalism cannot make the world from less wars. And the liberalism and the go to the liberalism cannot save the world. Actually, I will make a one step further. Not only liberalism, I don't think any ideology can save the world. I don't think any ism can make the world safe. You find that right? And the war not only happened between the liberalism, just now we have the four cases, and also the war between the Muslims in the Middle East today, every day. They have the same religion. Then you find that there's a war between the Russia and the Georgia. They have the same religion. And when uh, who, they, 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 uh, Huntington argued about the conflicts of civilization, actually, the conflicts within or the intra-civilization, even, even worse, even dangerous, even uh, horrible. And so the same was we have war with Vietnam. There are, we are all communist countries. So I don't think any ideology have that, fun, have that kind of a, 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 a function to prevent war between the countries who share the same ideology. Ideology do not have that uh, function. So I make a one step further from <laughs> Mr. Cameron. He, he, only, he only argue that liberalism do not have that uh, for my, my argument is that no ideology has a, a role like that. Okay, finally, I will spend a few minutes on what? On, about how to manage the competition between China and the US. And uh, I think that the competition between China and US will become the major issue of the world. And it will have the largest impact on the international politics. I don't think any companies, any competition, and have the impact on, uh, uh, on the world like uh, uh, this between China and the US. You see, the Brexit, the Brexit impact cannot get beyond the Europe, but just in a very small area of the part of the world. All of these wars in the Middle East cannot get beyond that region. But the trade war between China and the US is a very peaceful. And the neither side use major weapons to fight about trade war, and then this war has impact all over the world. Every guy complains that, hey, you stop. You guys fight against each other, and look at our economy, look at our trade, and we all suffer from that. What they said, when the elephants fight against each other, the grass suffer, right? <laughs> so people, that means that why both China and US agree with each other, the Bilateral relationship between China and the U.S. is the most important relationship on the world. But it is not in a positive way. It's in a negative way. It has an impact on others, not positively, than the very negatively. So here I will say, first, if we want to manage this competition, like what we can do, and we should adopt a realist uh, 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 theory, to look at our relationship. That means admit it. The core of the relationship between China and the US is a competition. It's not cooperation. Like uh, Professor Misha Hammer argues, and the things good for good is good for a uh, gender, right? And uh, I will say that actually the same. For China and the US, both sides have to agree on this. Okay, the competition between us and it's a core of our relationship. Why we should admit it, the competition between us? Only when we admit it, the competition is the core of our relationship, then you will seriously consider how to manage the competition. If you deny that, if you say, oh, there's no competition. Competition is a byproduct. The main, the core of a relationship is the cooperation. You will never seriously consider how to manage the competition. You don't think the competition is a, is a really big issue. It's more important than cooperation. 
Only we we agree that competition is more important than cooperation. Then you give the first priority to the uh, to management. The second that both sides must be concerned. And uh, like uh, because uh, we are all realists and we are also nationalists, so we can say every country's uh, foreign policy is driven by national interests. We have to admit that. So everyone has to tell the world that my policy serves my interests first. That's not yours. And it's not the rest of the world. And any policy driven by the, the other country's interests rather than their own interests, <coughs> first, is unbelievable. Second, it will bring more disasters. But why? When you make decisions according to your interests, and you will do the calculation of benefit and the cost. Otherwise, if you make a foreign policy for other countries, you only can consider the benefit, never want to pay, uh, consider the cost. No one want to pay the cost for others. So that will be dangerous. That means that you can never have a conciliation between two countries. Only two countries concern their own interests, do the calculation very carefully about the benefit and the cost, and then they will know what we should do and what the other side can tolerate. So final point is that. Now for manager China and US relationship, do not only need to very careful calculation of, about the benefit and the uh, 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 cost, and also must consider the transparency of a tolerance. We must consider how much the other side can tolerate, how much damage and the other side can tolerate from the damage I made to the other side, and they, they can follow it. Otherwise, if we, any side go beyond that, it's a very possibly cause to transfer the trade war to what? To real war. So for managing the trade war, we must not only consider the benefits and the costs, and also considering the tolerance. This is nothing new. This is what? This is knowledge we learn from the uh, arms control. For a long time, the U.S. and Soviet Union managed the arms control between them based on what? Based on about the considering how much the other side can tolerate civil attack. The civil loss, civil casualty is a very serious concern for the arms control. So if China and the U.S. Want, can reach any agreement, both sides have, considering, have to consider how to make the transparency of a tolerance of a the, uh, the, the loss or the damage they can, they can do. Okay, I think I stop here. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yan. I can find a, a comment between Professor Yan and Mia Shaiman. Both of them can finish their uh, presentations in 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, so yeah, thanks for Professor Yen's uh, explanation of the uh, difference between between you. According to my understanding, so you have a, a, a different pr uh, priority of uh, independent variables to explain the world yeah. politics. And uh, so uh, because you have different, so, so that's why I should encourage my students to buy both of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, so. We will, have, we will uh, uh, have a next oh, round of dialogue in the debate. So other after that, so we have the Q&A. So, the, uh, and the first, please. Okay. I just say a few words about the subject of leadership uh, that Professor Yan raised in his, obviously in his book and also in his comments. Uh, I believe that leadership matters, but leadership doesn't matter very much. <laughs> when you think about theories that explain how the world works, what you have to do is you have to figure out which factors do you think are the most important. And you take those two or three factors and you put them in the theory. And then you take all the other factors and you leave them on the cutting room floor. Now, I believe, again, that leadership matters, 
but it just doesn't matter very much. What really matters is the balance of power. And the reason that China and the United States have what are basically antagonistic relations today, and the reason that the United States really has its gun sights on China today, has nothing to do with leadership. Let me qualify that. It has little to do with leadership. <laughs> Maybe qualify it a bit more. It has very little to do with leadership. <laughs> and it has a lot to do with a shift in the balance of power. Whether Donald Trump gets reelected or not, in my opinion, doesn't matter much at all for US-China relations. If China continues to grow economically and therefore militarily, the United States will continue to have an antagonistic relationship with China and vice versa, no matter who's in the White House. Because leadership doesn't matter that much. Uh, now, the professor pointed out that he thought that Donald Trump mattered in the sense that if you look at Donald Trump's behavior in foreign policy, he has not started any wars. Whereas his three predecessors, Barack Obama, George W. Bush, and Bill Clinton, all started wars. I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, and whatever you think of Donald Trump, I think that's a good thing. The last thing the United States needs at this point in time uh, are more wars. But the question you have to ask yourself is, is Trump really, is Trump's personality what's responsible for this change? And I would argue a little bit. <laughs> I would argue that there are two other factors that account for what's happened here. First of all, his three predecessors operated in a unipolar system where they were free to crusade, where they were free to start these foolish wars. Trump is operating in a multipolar world. It's a different structure. And the incentives for him not to go to war in places like Iraq and to get out of Syria are much greater because he's got to worry about balance of power politics, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese and the Russians. So I would point out to you, Professor Yan, that I think you have to take into account the structural change to account for Trump. The other thing is that Trump has the advantage that he watched what his predecessors did. I think if they had put you in the White House or me in the White House, that we would have behaved pretty much the way Trump has behaved because we <laughs> saw what happened previously when we started these crazy wars. They all turned into disasters. You heard my description of the Middle East in my formal comments. And then my final point to you about leadership is that I agree with you uh, when you talk about the rise of China and the importance that Chinese leaders have had in fostering that growth. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, I think, was of enormous importance. And we can point to all sorts of other examples in history where leaders really matter for what happens inside a state. But it's important to emphasize that I'm not talking about the growth of states. That, that's not part of my theoretical explanation. right? I, I can't <coughs> explain with my realism change inside of states. And I think that leadership does matter in that case. Right? So I'm not someone who argues that leadership never matters. I'm just saying that when you talk about international politics and you talk about a given set of states on the system, I think how they interact with each other in an anarchic world where there's no higher authority is pretty much the same for every state. You started off by saying that I believe that states behave the same way in anarchy. I think you're absolutely right. I believe states are black boxes. 
I don't see any difference between China and the United States in my theory. I understand that in reality there are some differences, but those differences are down on the cutting room floor, right? China's a black box, the United States is a black box. And when you're a state in the international system, there's no higher authority, you can't know the intentions of other states, there may be some really powerful states out there that eventually have malign intentions towards you, you have no choice but to compete for power. You have no choice but to want to dominate your region of the world. So I think that China's goals in foreign policy are no different than the United States' goals in foreign policy. And in that world, leadership just doesn't matter very much, very much. <laughs> that, that's, that's my basic story. And I think, and Professor Yan, of course, can speak for himself, but I think that if you read his book and you listen to him talk, he believes that structure matters. He doesn't say that my structural argument is foolish. He understands that there's a very powerful logic there. He just thinks that other factors like leadership matter a lot, and therefore they should be included in the theory. But I think he's wrong. <laughs> Okay, just now, um, uh, Professor uh, Mir Shamer tells us uh, 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 in one way, and we do, uh, uh, do not agree with each other. So I uh, respond uh, uh, to this uh, uh, statement. And first, and how much the leadership matters in international politics? First, I think I agree with uh, Mir Shamer on the role of the international power structure. Agree with you. But within this uh, power structure, the same power structure, and uh, you will find that the leaders will adopt a different strategy to deal, to deal with the same situation. Different strategy to deal with the same situation and purchase the same in their national interest. And uh, so the same structure, especially the an anarchical system, make the old countries follow the same principle, self-help. But the self same principle, it doesn't mean that they adopt the same strategy. Just like we have the young people here, and the same principle to guide you for boys to purchase beautiful girl, right? To purchase the beautiful girl is the principle to driving you away to woo the girls. But then you adopt a different strategy to woo the beautiful girls. Someone try to use money, someone try to use a high degree of the uh, homework, and some try to <laughs> use their right, use their talent. And so different uh, pe people adopt a different strategy to achieve the same goal by the same principle. The principle the same, right? Okay, here, the old boys uh, want to the uh, most beautiful girl. And <laughs> so here, when we're talking about the structure, the impact on the policy makings between China and the US, I would say that this structure, I agree with the profession, would inevitably increase the tension between China and the US. No matter Democrats leaders of the Republicans, like uh, uh, even the after Trump, we have the Democrats to uh, uh, become the, uh, to, to the, take over the, uh, the, the White House. The tension between China and the US will increase rather than decrease. That's true. I agree with that. But it doesn't mean that uh, the structure makes the tension increase. Well, the diff the pres different president will adopt the same strategy contain China. Even they all agree with the containment, they use a different way to contain China. And for instance, and the Trump prefer economic approach instead of a military approach. And Trump prefer the trade war instead of the proxy war. And the during the and now you find that they will during the Cold War, they prefer the proxy war instead of trade war. So from my understanding, come to the strategy. I do not mean the, the techniques. I mean the grand strategy will be different. So that's uh, what I, uh, I'm asking about. The last thing is about the, the, uh, the change of international power structure. 
and the the different the different take time for Obama and uh, uh, the uh, Trump to uh, run the United States only one day. So the difference between is only one day, right? And uh, Obama uh, handled power to the uh, 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 to the Trump, but the change of the international configuration or the power structure from the unipolar to the bipolar or multipolar is not one day. It takes time. It takes a, at least a, if now the most people think that the change of the international configuration started from 2010 and when Obama uh, adopted the uh, uh, pivotal strategy. So from uh, 2010 to 2000, uh, uh, 2017 is our, the seven years. So from understanding, we cannot argue that. And the trend and the policy toward China is driven by the change of the international configuration. Because of that international configuration are exactly the same like uh, the last uh, two years, at least, of Obama's period. So the change of the international configuration take, taking time, but the change of the foreign policy to China by the uh, White House and it can be adjusted over one day. So that's why I think the leadership is a, a very important. The final thing is a very theoretical. The, theoretically, we have a different uh, independent uh, variable for our theory. And my independent variable, the fundamental independent variable, is uh, the leadership. And uh, uh, Professor Mish Hammers is the uh, uh, international, uh, the anar anarchical system and, uh, of the international society. And so because of we come from a different into, uh, uh, the, uh, independent variable, so we have a different explanation about what? About the uh, policymakers' be behavior. So from my understanding, and the uh, professor's uh, theory mainly emphasized the common behavior the same behavior shared by all the nation states. I will emphasize both, both the same behavior and the different behaviors between the uh, uh, nation states. So the last thing is just a professor mentioned that he brought back a, a black box, the state. I opened the state. So theoretically, that's our difference. <laughs> So uh, we, we, we still have uh, maybe 10 minutes to do this uh, around the, uh, debate. Okay. Uh, so both of you have uh, five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask Professor Yan a question. We have this country called China that's rising, and we have this country called the United States that's been the dominant power. And his argument is that leadership matters. So I want him to tell us what the difference is going to be in Chinese leadership and American leadership and how this is going to play out in terms of the rise of China. OK. When we talk about the types of the leadership, and not only between the leadership of different countries, we also compare the different leadership, different type of leaderships within the same countries. So now the question is about the different leadership. Sometimes you have different, different countries have the same type of internet, uh, 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 national leaders. And for instance, and most people believe that uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, a Turkish, a Turkish president who, Erdogan. Yeah, Erdogan. It's quite like the Putin. There are different uh, 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 nations, but then there's the same type of leaders. But then if you compare the Trump with the Macron, the two countries are two different type of leaders and the Germans are transfer. So from my understanding, if you're talking about the China and the US leaders, I will say they have some thing they share in terms of strategy. Neither Trump nor Chinese leader and prefer to solve the disputes through war. And from my understanding, both sides at this moment try to shy away from the military solution to their trade war. So that's the common character and the share. 
there's also different things. Different things in that, and that is uh, how much you want to have your nose picked into other countries' uh, domestic politics. This is different. And the US and the Trump is not that enthusiastic as his aid, but he had to represent the group of people. They have, they have to initiate some uh, conflicts with China in terms of ideology. <laughs> but China, the strategy is different. China said, OK, we do not want to have an ideological confrontation with you. Even you do that, I try to shun away. I do not want to repeat Soviet Union's strategy and to carry out an ideological confrontation. So you see, there's some similarities and some differences. Okay. Mm. I, I would just say that uh, as I look at China and how it's behaved up to now, and how I think it will behave in the future, uh, I don't see much difference with the United States. Uh, I think that China is not a highly ideological state. I want to be very clear. I think if China were a unipolar, it would not have behaved like the United States behaved. I hope everybody understands that. If, I, if China is a unipolar, yeah. We're in a unipolar system, and China does not have to worry about the balance of power, much as the United States did not have to worry about the balance of power in 1990. I don't think China would behave as a crusader state, because it's not ideologically driven the way the United States is. Mm -hmm. okay? But the point is, we're not talking about a unipolar world, a multipolar world. And the question is, is China going to react to balance of power considerations? <laughs> there must be something about what I'm saying. <laughs> Such a coincidence. <laughs> yes, that somebody likes. No, we're, we're, on a serious note, we're in a multipolar world. And I, I think if you look at how China is behaving, it's behaving just like the United States. In a lot of your writings, you talk about a humane hegemon. And your view is that China is going to be a humane hegemon. In my opinion, there's no such thing as a humane hegemon. Hegemons are basically bullies by definition. <laughs> the United States is a rough and tough customer. Let's be honest about it. And I think you have to be very careful that you don't end up sounding like an American. <laughs> you know, the Americans say that we are a benign hegemon. You sometimes talk about China as if it's a humane hegemon. <laughs> and I really have my doubts about that. And the problem that China faces today, and I think almost all of you would agree, is that the United States is beginning to play rough and tough with China, right? Donald Trump is not fooling around. And even before Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton talked about the pivot to Asia. So the question you have to ask yourself is how will China, in all likelihood, react to that. And I would argue that China will not behave like a pussycat. That China will play rough and tough in return. And the United States will see everything that China does for defensive purposes as offensive in nature. And everything the United States does for defensive purposes, the Chinese will see as offensive. As many of you know, this is the classic security dilemma. And they'll both be playing rough and tough with each other. And that's why leadership doesn't matter very much. Yes, it is true that sometimes a Chinese leader will choose a clever strategy, or to put it in slightly different terms, a smart strategy. <clears throat> and other times, a Chinese leader will choose a foolish strategy. And you get the same thing on the American side. This happens, and in that sense, leadership matters. But at a more macro level, when you just start thinking about how these two gorillas 
are going to deal with each other. Even if you believe, as a Chinese person, that the Americans are driving the train, and they're the real aggressors here, the fact is you've got to play rough and tough anyway, and you end up in a rough and tumble world. And I'm sad to say that that's, what I, that's where I think we are headed, and I don't think leadership can do anything to obviate or ameliorate that problem in any significant way. Okay, so I think I should end the debate between you directly. So let's open, let's open for the uh, for the audience. So you, uh, for questions, if you have a different answers, that means you have debate continue, right? So uh, as moderator, so I, I think I would raise two questions, maybe relevant to uh, uh, yeah, yeah, something relevant to your theory, according to your theory predictions. So. Especially after seven years since 1913, the first debate between you. Do you, both of you, have different answers, believe that China could rise peacefully? This is the first question. So do you still believe that or not believe that? The second question says, according to your theory prediction, so realists should believe that allies is very common in world politics, in the international system. So according to your theory, do you believe that China would or should align with Russia? <laughs> I'll answer these questions. Uh, very quickly so we can go to questions from the audience. Uh, for better or for worse, my view <laughs> Oh my god. It is really cheeky. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> for better or for worse, my views have not changed since 2001. <laughs> and what I said in 2013 is the same as what I said here. Uh, I will say now, as I said then, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, with regard to the question of whether China should ally itself with Russia, absolutely. <laughs> China should ally itself with every possible country it can find. Uh, and the United States will go to great lengths to minimize the number of countries that are allied with China and to maximize the number of countries that are allied with the United States. And again, the Chinese will do the same. And again, that's part of the rough and tumble of international politics. Well, my is also a uh, verb brief. And uh, from the very beginning, I never ruled out the possibility for China to be back into war during the process of the rise. And because this process is really long. And it doesn't mean that uh, China becomes a superpower, it means that it, China implemented the process of the rise. And only China surpassed the US, you can see China uh, uh, implemented the whole process of the rise. So from my standing, it may take at least another 20 years. So in the next 20 years, no one can guarantee that China will not break into the war. But I will say, and there's because of the nuclear weapons, and I don't think that the, uh, the danger of the direct war between China and the U.S. is a very, very much. I think that's a very, very, very slight. The possibility is the proxy war, and that means that it, it, by, I think at least at this moment, you cannot rule out the possibility for China to drive into a proxy war, but not direct war. The second thing is uh, uh, about the alliance between China and the, uh, Russia. Actually, I have strongly suggested China to make alliance with Russia for years, but this idea was uh, frankly rejected by both Chinese and Russian governments. <laughs> <laughs> well, here I will say that these are facts and strongly suggest uh, my argument. You see, China believes uh, very little in balance of power. China do not want to make alliance with others to improve or increase its strength to reshape the balance of power between China and the US. So that's why China do not adopt my strategy, but adopt a strategy totally opposite. They 
resist non-alliance principle. They don't want to make alliance uh, to change the uh, balance of power between China and the U.S. And so in this way, I would say that China actually is not what kind of a human authority, uh, human authority, uh, human authority uh, uh, leadership. Human authority leadership, my argument, will make him alliance. Because human authority leadership has a kind of responsibility for what? To protect his allies and to maintain a favorable uh, power structure in, uh, for himself. But China rejected this idea. So human authority is different from the concept of denial hegemon. Denial hegemon means that you are, you are nice to others. It doesn't mean that you let others benefit from your leadership. Human authority leadership means that you provide protection, let others to benefit from your leadership. When other, other countries, they feel that they can benefit from your leadership that rather than from the other leadership, they will follow you. So in, uh, in this way, I think, uh, I, first I agree, China at this moment is not human authority, but uh, in history, in our history, we do find that in the ancient time, we have that kind of a leadership in Chinese history. And when we have the human authority leadership, there will be less war. And I, you cannot rule out the, uh, the, the possibility of the war. And the human authority will use war to maintain the world order. Thank you. Thank you.